You might be seated. Praise the Lord. We've still got people coming in. Isn't that amazing? Glory to God. Let me say this as you're getting settled. What I'm about ready to tell you and talk about tonight, I don't take lightly. The Bible said he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. I call that the executive branch of God's government. The Bible said he gave some, didn't say he gave all. There's quite a difference between an evangelist and a traveling preacher. An evangelist is in that executive branch of the government of God. He never crosses the office of a pastor, but a traveling preacher does it all the time because he's looking for something, see. And when you stand in the office, and it's a glorious office, or in these offices, I don't take it lightly. And I don't want people to leave here tonight because I know you're going to be blessed and bomb, man. And don't bill me as the man that went to heaven. Because we're all going if you're saved. <laughs> if you're not, well, you're going to, you better enjoy heat because it's going to get hot where you're going. <laughs> but God called me to be an evangelist to preach the gospel. When this wonderful experience had happened, I didn't tell Kathy until five days after it happened. I don't take it lightly. I, I spoke this and put it on a set of tapes in my home church under the authority of my pastor. Because, you know, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in the spectacular. I'm interested in the supernatural. I find the spectacular brings glory to man. The supernatural brings glory to God. And if you want a movement to flow in the anointing of God, and if you want it to continue, never let it get over into the spectacular. Keep it in the supernatural. Amen. They tried to do that with Jesus' ministry. Oh, you're a great miracle worker. He said, it's not me that doeth the work. It's my Father in me. Amen. Notice that. They tried to, uh, you know, make him spectacular. They said, you know, you're, you're that miracle. He said, no, it's my Father. I come to do the will of my Father. And the only time I've talked a little bit about this was during some of the believers conventions as the Lord began to release me to say some things. And uh, because, you know, people tend to take it and want to run. And, and all I will say is an experience that I love and enjoy and you'll be blessed by it. But what keeps you in the Word of God is simply the Word of God. So you grow daily in this, not just Sunday, daily. So turn with me tonight to the book of Genesis chapter 1. I want to read a verse of scripture, a few verses. And I'm going to deal with close encounters of the God kind. I called it close encounters because when God gets close to you, you are, your spirit's going to know it, your soul's going to know it, and your body's going to know it. And some people say God's not real. Oh, just hang around. He's here today. People ask me, what's my favorite book in the Bible? Well, my favorite Old Testament book is Genesis. My favorite New Testament book is Ephesians. I love them two books. I just enjoy those. And I want to read some scripture out of the King James, Genesis chapter 1. And I want to start reading with verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So now look at me. How many of you want to know what God looks like? He looks like me. <laughs> he looks like you. We're made in his image. Why do you act the way you act, Brother Jesse? I'm made in his likeness. Let me tell you something about God. He's not quiet. He is a noisy God. He's theatrical in the things that he does. Think about that. When he came up to the Red Sea, the Bible said with a blast of his nostrils, the sea departed. He blew his nose and the sea just hooked it. Bless God, got out the way. He's an all-consuming, powerful God. And he's loud, very noisy. He don't walk around like this. He don't do that. He is loud. One day he's coming back, he's going to holler so loud, he's going to blow your grandma right out the grave. He's a noisy God. He expresses what he feels. You need to know him tonight. He said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Uh, verse 26. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Notice dominion over the fish of the sea. So if you're a fisherman, you ought to catch fish. If you got dominion over the fowl of the air. If you're a bird, honey, you ought to get birds. 
over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them. You notice he didn't say God tried to kill them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful. I love that. And multiply, and replenish the earth. And the next two words most people forget, or three words, and subdue it. Kind of an odd word. And subdue it. See, God was hinting to Adam that in a perfect society, there are going to be some things get out of line. So subdue it. Put it down. What he was saying was, snake coming. <laughs> snake coming. Subdue it. Put it down. Snake coming. See, my father, when I lived with him, he subdued me. I never forget his famous words. He used to tell me, boy, I brought you here. I can take you out. <laughs> Don't mess with me, son. I'll kill you and make another one look just like you. <laughs> and I'd say, okay, okay, dad. <laughs> he would subdue me. Subdue me. So notice that it's kind of odd that God would use that kind of word in a perfect society. But God was letting him know there's a snake coming with a mouth. Shut him up. Because you have dominion over everything God created. Of course, Adam didn't do that. I want to talk about that in, in a sense that the first close encounter of the God kind came through Adam. Adam is the only man in the flesh that saw Jehovah Elohim, Yahweh God, face to face. He was two inches from his nose and God said he breathed into him. He didn't give him CPR. Because if he'd have done that, he'd have grabbed him by the nose and breathed in his mouth. But the Bible said he breathed into his nostrils. And Adam opened his eyes and saw the Creator, a close encounter of the God kind. And when someone dies, I'll show you how it happens. That same breath that baby receives when it's born, God is two inches from that person's mouth, from that person's face. And when they go, oh, he receives that breath of life back into himself. He breathes and things start living. He inhales and it comes back into him. Think about that. That's what we made in his image and in his likeness. In my first encounter, I, I, as I said earlier, the Lord always bothered me. I never did understand God, and I'm not a unique individual by no means. People say, why it happened to you? I don't know why. I'll just tell you, it just did. But my first encounter with the Lord, as far as in, where I could physically understand what was going on, I was about nine years old. I never feared God because I didn't know if he really existed. I didn't understand God. I was afraid of God. I knew if God would come to town, he surely would kill me. I was afraid to take communion. How many of you were afraid to take communion? Hold your hand up. Be honest. How many of y'all been Catholic? Hold your hand up. We have a, they had a doctrine, and they still have a doctrine in the Catholic Church called transubstantiation, which means when you take the host, that it literally becomes the body of Christ. How many of you know what I'm talking about if you've been a Catholic? How many of you people, when you walked up to take communion, you'd put your tongue out, and that priest had put that host on you. And he goes, don't want to say, and see, you wasn't allowed to chew it. Brother Osteen said that this morning. He said, okay, go ahead and eat the bread. We wasn't allowed to do that. What happened was you'd walk back to your seat and that host would get stuck <laughs> up in the roof of your mouth. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? And when your mama wasn't looking, you'd <laughs> try to get that thing out of there. <laughs> Is that right? See, because the Catholic people say that that literally becomes the body of Christ. I never get one time I came back and I went, my mama said, what's the matter with you, boy? You are biting Jesus. Whoa, man, I, I don't want to bite Jesus. So I, I just let Jesus slip down my throat. I didn't understand it. You know, when we took the host this morning, I looked around and some of y'all still were like this. Because, boy, you just didn't do that. And, of course, when we went over to the Protestants, they gave us some grape juice to drink. I'll never forget, and I took my first communion as a Protestant. I was, I was a little bit of fella. I was about, well, about nine years old. And they, get, and they man walked up to me with a plate of crackers and some, and some grape juice. And I looked at the crack. I just got me a handful of crackers. And my mom was just hit me. So I said, well, the man gave me some, mama. And I never forget, he handed me the grape juice. And I thought, we get to drink here. Okay. 
<laughs> you know how kids are, they want to drink it so bad. They stick their tongue in that little glass if you don't watch it. You know, try to get it off. And I thought, man, they do it different here. So I couldn't wait until I could, I had these crackers in my hand. <laughs> he said, let's take up the body of Christ together. And I had my, <laughs> you see, you could eat crackers in the Protestant churches. And I thought, boy, this is great, man. And he, he said, now let's take up the cup together. And I'm about ready to drink this cup. And this blood curdling scream came out this preacher. And I'm, I'm going, I'm about ready to drink. He said, if you drink this unworthily, you'll damn your soul into hell. I went, no, we don't want none of this. <laughs> I ain't going to hell for a glass of well change, brother. I ain't all I need. <laughs> I was afraid to take communion. I was scared, boy. How many of y'all were scared? Oh, your hand up. Yeah. You see, the most holiest act you can do on the earth, fear was put into it so you wouldn't receive it. Amazing how the devil would do that with theological, homiletical, hermeneutical, philosophical teaching. I may not sound smart, but I'm educated. <laughs> well, at nine years old, I'll never forget it. I was not afraid of God. I had my first vision of the Lord. I came, we lived in a mobile home, and uh, I just went back to my bed to go to bed, and... I saw a man come up to me, point blank, blunt. It was, and it was like a vision. He was in the sky. And it was thundering and lightning. And he said, fear God, boy. Fear God. And I thought, man, I got scared. I ran back to my mom. I said, I saw this guy. And he told me to fear God. And, I, you know, you, you figured my mama would say, okay. She said, you're yeah, heathen, son. You need, you got to fear God. I didn't understand God. I was scared of God. But yet I would, not, I sensed his spirit around me at all times. I mean, as a small child, I would know it. I could feel and sense the presence of God. And what would happen, what I did not know until I was a man was, I have an older brother and a younger brother, and I'm the middle son. I also have a sister. But my mom would, came in there after we got, she got saved. And she said, Lord, I want a preacher. Now I was in the middle. There was three of us in the room, you understand? Which one's going to be my preacher? And, and the Lord said, Jesse. And my mom said, no, I can't be Jesse. <laughs> Not Jesse, man. He's a heathen. Man, he's a heathen man. And she laid hands on me while I was asleep. Now, I don't know this. I don't even remember it. She told me later on after I got saved and said, God, I ask you to call I, you calling this boy. He may not realize it, but Lord, wherever he goes, follow him. And God honored his word to my mom. I couldn't go nowhere. I'd be smoking dope, snorting cocaine, man. And I could hear God. Hey. And I'd look at my drum. Did you hear that? I ain't heard nothing. I said, man, God's in here. Whoa, man. You know? And people thought we were just bad tripping. But what it was was the spirit of God honoring mom's voice wherever I would go. I never forget one time I was, went to Mexico and it was in a terrible, terrible place where sin was running rampant right in the middle of this club. I mean, I can't even mention the things that were going on in Mexico in this club where, where I was. And I heard God holler in an audible voice, get out of there now. And I hooked it. I just stood up. And Jimmy was with me. He said, what's the matter? I said, God said, let's get out of here. He said, who's in it? I said, God, he's going to kill us all. Let's get out of here. <laughs> I never forget it. Man, I hooked it out of that place. I left. I went back to my hotel room and I called New York. I actually called Homer, Louisiana, where my mother and them lived. And I said, Mama. She said, yeah, it's in that old nasty, stinking, slutty-looking nightclub. And I was praying God told me there it was. And I prayed for God to tell you to get out of there. Did you hear him? I said, he has spoken, Mama. <laughs> I mean, it happened. Close encounters of the God kind. Constantly. As a small boy, everywhere I'd go. I'll never forget one time I told a teacher this. I said, the Lord follows me. She looked at me and went, yes. I said, I'm not kidding you. He followed me. He'll probably come through this door in a minute. I don't know. I knew it. And she said, now, why, what would make you believe that? I said, they don't have, I said it, it's just happening. Of course, she didn't understand it. And I didn't understand it, but Mama understood it. She knew it. At 17 years old, I borrowed one of my girlfriend's cars, and I was driving it back. 
And I was about ready to encounter another close encounter. I'm leading you up to the heavenly vision. And I, it, it, on the tape, it's going, there's, it takes three hours to do this, but I'm going to condense it. To make a long story short, I was driving, and my mother told me the day before, she said, Jesse, I saw a tidal wave of the blood of Jesus over you, boy. I thought, oh, here she go with this spiritual stuff. I was 17 years old. I said, that's nice, mama. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you. I said, I don't want to hear about that. She said, I tell you what, Paul, my father was Paul. She said, Paul, I, ha I saw a tidal wave of the blood of Jesus over Jesse. And, and daddy said, well, that's good. He always called my mother mama. That's good, mama. She said, I don't know what it means, but there's something, something. And the next day I was in a car and I was driving down the road. You know how 17-year-old boys drive. And uh, I was driving pretty fast and I went to the left-hand side to pass this car and it was a rainstorm coming. I mean, just, just raining, but I decided to pass it anyway. And the, the engine, and I took a chance. I mean, I took, it was a close call. And I got up to about 65, 68 miles an hour to pass this car and the engine went dead. It was one of those Corvairs. Y'all remember those little Corvairs? And that, of course the car was coming at me in my lane and I didn't know what to do. I mean, all of a sudden, I mean, no engine, nothing. I mean, just, I guess the water just went in the back and just drowned out the engine. And uh, what I should have done was just leave it in gear, but as a stand, I put my foot on the clutch. If I'd have left it, at least it stopped some. I lost control of the car. And I flipped the car three times, in over in, flipping. I lost control, went to the side, jumped a six-foot mailbox, and started flipping. And, this, and I'll never forget this. I, I, as I was flipping, I was holding onto the steering wheel. And I saw the door go, just break the door. And a piece of jagged steel was coming at me. You know, it was coming as, as a, it was like an accordion. The car was starting to bend like this. And something grabbed my shoulder. I mean, grabbed me and held me in that seat. The steering wheel broke in my hand. Now watch this. When the steering wheel broke in my hand, popcorn came out the steering wheel. Popcorn. I never forget, I went, popcorn. <laughs> but I had this hand on my shoulder. When I came to a stop, they had to cut me out with a welding torch. It made the papers. I mean, my shoulder was jammed up. I was upside down, was on the, on the, uh, on the roof, upside down. But this hand was on my, I couldn't see the hand, but I had the pressure. And I went, whoa, what is in here? And I felt the hand of the Lord. I knew it was God. See, I didn't know at that time, but now I knew what it was. I mean, it slowly came off of me. And people had stopped. They said, the kid at the car catches a fire burn up. They had to cut me out. And, they, and I kept hollering, there's popcorn in here. Popcorn. <laughs> and uh, they thought I was in total shock. And I, and I had a close encounter of the God. God literally held me. Because you see, when the steering wheel broke, I flew over to the other side where that piece of steel of that car was. And it went right through my, my, my side and would have killed me. That's that. I mean, that hand holding me physically down just held me. And I'm looking and I went, oh God, what is this? What is this? But I, I you know, I, everybody thought I was in shock. The ambulance guy picked me up and, and they, they cut me out and I fell into the mud and I said, hey, and they just grabbed me, you know, and said, don't move. And, and it, you know, if you don't die in a car accident, you'll die in an ambulance the way they drive. <laughs> Rushing me to the hospital. And I kept saying, there's popcorn, popcorn came out the steering wheel. They go, the guy's in shock, he's in shock. You know, they're hooking me up and all that. I said, listen, somebody grab me. There's, somebody grab my hand, my shoulder. I'd have died, I was flying over. And they went, yeah, yeah, and they, you know, couldn't say anything. But I knew something had happened. A close encounter to God kind. I got to the hospital. They called my mom and dad, they come a rushing. And what was amazing, my mom was two minutes behind the accident. Or oh, two minutes behind the ambulance picking me up. And when they drove by, they, my mother didn't know, I'm in the ambulance going the other way. She said, Paul, let's pray. That's a terrible accident. Pray to God no one died. And I'm her son. And she don't know this. And they get to the, uh, uh, when I got to the hospital, I told them to call my mom. So they came running. And this is kind of funny. And boy, they called my mother. I said, Mama, I said, uh, I'm in this accident. And then she, I heard her go, Paul. And then she realized that the accident she had just passed, it was me. She said, did you feel anything in that car? I said, mama, popcorn came out the steering wheel. <laughs> that went right over her head. She said, besides that. I said, mama, somebody grabbed my shoulder. 
She said, Paul, that's that blood, that's the blood of God over Jesse that I saw the other day. That's God protecting my boy, holding him down into that car so he wouldn't die and go to hell. And I'm thinking, Mom, I said, Mom, she said, don't move. How can I move? I will be up there. Boy, I mean, they got in the car and ran like crazy. And my mom always worried about boys, you know. And my cousin, she comes in the hospital. She said, are you all right? No, you're all right. I said, yeah, my mom, all right. She said, is she, uh, you know, she saw all these doctors and they were undressed me. She said, is your underwear clean? Is everything okay? <laughs> you know how mama is. It's embarrassing. I said, mama, after the third flip. <laughs> I said, mama, why are you asking me this kind of stuff? But mama worried about that stuff. Y- y'all had a mama like that? Worried about that. But, but you know how boys, oh my God, she wants you to change underwear. We just turn them inside out and put them on, you know. Didn't make us no difference. We didn't care. You know, you boys, you're crazy. You know, you don't care. Worrying about underwear and I'm getting killed in a car. They, you know, I got one cut on my hand and one slight cut over my eye. I would have died in that car. And they said, it's impossible for a person to live. Made the head, headlines. And they told, and, and they said that this, this young man said that something grabbed him and held him in the car. When I got home, the next day I was so sore I could hardly move. I said, Daddy, I, I want to go see that car. I said, Daddy, popcorn, come out stand with me. He said, what is wrong with you, boy? Why are you saying that? I said, everybody thinks I'm crazy. I'm telling you, popcorn, come out the stand with me. I want to go see that car. So we went to the, uh, a place called A-Bear's Wrecking Yard. They had to pick that car up with a winch. And when I got there and looked inside, the whole bottom floor of the car was full of popcorn. And what we ascertained was that there was a bag of popcorn in the glove compartment. And at the time the car was flipping, at the time the steering wheel broke in my hand, the glove compartment flew open, the popcorn hit the steering wheel, and I see popcorn, man, everywhere. (laughs) And I realized, while uh, it registered so much in my mind, to prove to people that I wasn't in shock, that I knew what I was seeing, you see. Different close encounters of the God kind, those things. Well, as I began to, you know, uh, get more and more sin, I would walk down those corridors, getting ready to play nightclubs and rock concerts, and I could hear the Lord talking to me. It was in my mind. I'd say, leave me alone. Leave me alone. And sometimes I'd stop and just go call long distance, and I'd say, and it'd be my mom or Kathy, y'all pray it, quick pray it. And I'd slam the phone down. And I mean, it was bothering me. It was God reaching that. That prayer at five years old, wherever he go, I'll follow him. Trying to get away from it. Well, you heard the story how I got saved. And uh, the Lord called me into the ministry. Now, he didn't call me immediately into the ministry when I got saved. God don't send babies on the field. Their pampers will fall off. You got to submit to the authority of a pastor, become a part of a local work. You have to, in other words, learn things. When God called us to the ministry, these things, I I would pray and the Lord would answer me. Ladies and gentlemen, I can honestly say that everything I've prayed, the Lord has done it for me. I I have to say that. I I don't mean that. That's not an overstatement. But I, I pray according to the wisdom and the word of God. He's been so kind to me. Call me to the ministry. But like any person, I heard this statement, I'd rather wear out than rust out. I began to preach. In my first year of evangelism, I did 51 weeks, 51 revivals. I've done that in seven crusades and 11 conventions, just running constantly. And uh, I went to Jonesville, Louisiana, and I was having chest pains. I didn't tell Kathy. I mean, I was preaching every day, sometimes twice a day. I'm talking Sunday through Sunday. I'd, I'd preach anywhere I didn't care if just give me an opportunity to talk about Jesus. And my encounter, I, I never forget, I was at this pastor's home. In those days, we stayed in the homes years ago. And I always like to read a scripture before I go to bed at night, kind of put the word of God in my mind so it can saturate me. See, and some, the Lord will give me a sermon sometime in my dream or sometime in my sleep. And I keep a little cassette player and used to write them down. Now I don't. I just press the button and say, when I wake up, I'm going to preach on this. And I'll say it, record it, take it off, and go on back to bed. But I was reading my Bible. And as I read this Bible, and I had the sheet pulled up to about right here, and I had my Bible like this. 
And, all, and when I looked up, there's the biggest man I've ever saw in my life standing at the end of the bed. And he had long, blonde hair. And I looked at him, and it shocked me. It was 12, it was 12 o'clock. I had looked at, just looked at the clock, looked at my body, and there he was. And I said, oh, I mean, I didn't hear him come in. He just stood there physically like I see you people. And he looked at me, and he had blonde hair. I'll never forget it. And he said, I've been sent of the Lord to tell you to sleep. <laughs> and now you got to, I'm going, okay. okay. And I think what it was, was an angel of the Lord. I could physically see him like I physically see you. He said, I, he said it twice. I have been sent of the Lord to tell you to sleep. Sleep. And ladies and gentlemen, I was kind of sitting up in the bed. My head hit the back of that head, and my Bible did this. And for 12 solid hours, I slept. I woke up at 12 o'clock noon the next day in the same position with my Bible on my chest. Felt like a million bucks. I came out, told the pastor, I said, there was an angel of God in your house last night. He said, you know... I got two dogs that were going nuts. He said, I couldn't. I told him dogs, you're waking up. I said, man, I beat them dogs. He said, I've done everything I could to get them dogs to shut up. And I said, well, I didn't hear them barking. I didn't hear nothing. I said, but an angel of the Lord came. And the first thing he said, what do you look like? I said, he's a big man. Now, he didn't have wings. But he was huge and had blonde hair. And I'll never forget that. Different things. I began to see angels, close encounters of the God kind, preaching in a church one time in the middle of my message. I was preaching, and it wasn't a very, not in a very big church. There's about a hundred people there. Uh, maybe not that many, maybe uh, pretty close, but not that many. As I was preaching, I went, glory, and I turned around, and when I stood, stood and I turned around, the whole choir, I mean, there was no one up there, were well, just angels, looked like shafts of light. And I stopped preaching. I forgot the crowd. I went, whoa. And this lady from the back of the church jumped up and said, I see him too. <laughs> and I looked. I didn't know what to do. And they walked out of the choir. It's not a choir law, but just, you know, the seats there. As they walked out, I stopped. And one walked right by me. And he smiled at me. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you something. They walked right out into the crowd. The whole church fell out. Yeah, what? One person said, boom, hit the ground. I mean, I just looked, wham, everybody out, knocked down. And I didn't have nobody to talk to, so I sat down. <laughs> I, I literally, I did this. <laughs> I, and you don't have to believe this, but you, wait till you hear this heavenly vision. This is the truth. There were sinners in that building crawling to get out of that place. <laughs> Pastor church didn't believe in falling out in the spirit. It was a denominational church. Didn't believe in anything like that. Bit the dust. Him and his wife. His kids bit the dust. There wasn't one person standing. Finally, they began to get up out of the pews. They found a man in the foyer on his knees crawling to get out. He said, I am not into this stuff. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Trying to get out the church. A farmer. He said, I lost all strength. Yet the only two people saw those angels, me and that lady. I began to have experiences like that. And it began to become real frequent. So I began to call upon the Lord to see him. And I got a little angry at God. I said, look, you showed yourself to Peter. You showed yourself to Paul. Why don't you come see me? What's wrong? I mean, you know, you said you're no respected person, but it looks like you are. <laughs> now, of course, I was a baby Christian. I had a lick of sense, had my pampers on, you know. <laughs> I was praying wrong, but, you know, God, I understand those things. So in the middle of a meeting, I was called out one time, and my wife was with me. He said, I don't know who you are, sir, but you've been asking to see the Lord. And I said to myself, come on, partner, come on. <laughs> he said, the Lord is coming to see you. you he'll, he'll come to your home at night. He said, you, he called my wife my maid. He said, your maid, you will be sleeping with your maid. She will not awaken. She will not hear, but the Lord will come to see you. And I thought, my God, man, okay. So I stayed up all night that night, and nothing happened. <laughs> I stayed up three or four days, and nothing happened. Two weeks passed by, and nothing happened. 
And I was so aggravated and vexed. I said, that guy missed it good to you, wouldn't think. You know, they ought to burn him like they did them prophets that missed it in the Old Testament. <laughs> I mean, I was just irritated. That night I went, Kathy always goes to bed usually earlier than I do. It was about 12 o'clock. I went to bed and I got a habit of sleeping on my stomach, you know. Instead of my back, I was just sleeping on my stomach. And I looked and I fell off to sleep. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, I just opened my eyes. I mean, burn, I'm wide awake. And wind began to blow into my room. And wind, I'm talking wind, physical wind, ladies and gentlemen. First thing you think of, a tornado, hurricane, some wind began to blow through my skin and my, just blow. And the curtains came up over and on top the rods, blowing up. And I'm on my stomach and I lost all strength. I'm like, ah, oh, and I can see this wind blowing. What is happening? And I heard this voice ask me, you asked to see me, turn around. And I went, no, I'm not going. <laughs> no. I heard that physically with these audible ears. I mean, wind blowing through my fingernails, through my skin. Come, I mean, blowing. And I heard the voice again, physically. You, and it was in a low voice. You asked to see me. Turn around. And I went, oh, no, man. I mean, I didn't know what to do. My flesh was literally jumping like this. The first thing I thought of, Kathy. Kathy. So I'm like this, and I go, get up. Get up. And I'm hit. I bruised Kathy's arm with a bruise this big. I am hitting it. She's going. I'm so mad at the woman, man. I, get, get. God's in the room. Get up. Get up. I mean, I'm hitting her. I bruised her. She never woke up. The prophecy was coming to pass. And the third time, I'll never forget it. Said, you asked to see me. Now, you got to understand wind, physical wind. I'm not talking spirit. I'm talking physical. The curtain's flying everywhere. My wife's snoring. Can't get her up. Bless God. I'm scared to look at God. We got trouble here. We don't know what to do. I mean, I am hitting cat. And that three times that voice said, you asked to see me. The third time he said, you asked to see me, turn around. And I said, listen, listen. I mean, I didn't know what to do. All of a sudden the curtains went, and I turned around. Immediately, nothing. Got mad at myself. Stupid, stupid. <laughs> Dumb, stupid, stupid. You asked to see God, you fool, you won't even turn around. What's the matter with you? My God, you know how many people watch this? I'm so mad at myself. And that's Kathy. <sighs> I said, whoa, and I just kind of hit her again. She woke up. What's the matter with you? I said, you missed it. You missed it. <laughs> she said, what's the matter? I said, God was here. But no, you got to sleep. She said, God was in this room. She said, what'd he look like? <laughs> I, I didn't turn around. And she had a bruise on her arm. It was a close encounter. Things like that begin to happen to us quite often physical things. The day came, and this is where we want to get to. March of 1988, excuse me, August of 1988. I was at Magnolia, Arkansas at Magnolia Christian Center. I was preaching a revival for Pastor Paul Trochel, preaching a meeting. Wonderful church. In fact, I believe, um, who's that brother at Victory Church in Tulsa? What's his name? Billy Joe Dorothy's mother goes to this church. It was Monday. Pastor called me, said, hey, I'll pick you up about 12 o'clock and we'll go get some lunch. I said, fine. So he picks me up at the Best Western Hotel, room 105. Normal day. I knew something was up. I could sense it. My spirit didn't quite know what. You know, you get many different close encounters. And, and I'm trying to condense this because it's a long story. He said, Jesse, if you don't mind, he says, a steakhouse right across the street. You want to eat there? I said, yeah, we'll eat. That'd be fine. So we sit down, we order. I begin to get this compulsion to get back to my room. I mean, I mean, urgent. But I don't want to be rude. So here comes the food. They lay it down. It's steaming, man. The smoke's coming off of it. I look at the pastor and I said, I have to go. And he had a couple of friends, a couple of other ministers with him. He said, something wrong? Do you, are you sick? You feel bad? I said, no, I just, I got to get back to my room. Well, is there something wrong? I said, no, there ain't nothing wrong. Ain't nothing wrong. Paul, I don't know what. I just got this compulsion to get back to my room. 
I'm sorry. Excuse me. And I left the food on the table. I, he said, well, we'll bring you. I said, no, I'll just walk across the street. Now, here's the food. I felt so bad. You know, we eating lunch. The food's sitting there. I mean, just got on the table 10 seconds. Finally, I couldn't stand it. I said, Paul, excuse me. I'll see you tonight. I've got to get back to my room. Y'all excuse me. I got up and walked across the street. I walked across the street. I opened my door. I didn't see a thing. I took my do not disturb. Then no little thing. I put it on there and closed the door. It was one minute to one. I looked at the clock. You know those digital clocks that hotels have. And I knelt down. I, I didn't know what though. I had no idea. what. I said, in this position like this. I don't know if you can see me or not. Just, and I said, Lord, what? And I was sucked out of my room. I heard this, and I went, I just, now I don't know whether I was in my body or out of my body. I believe I was in my body. I was sucked through. I I just went through. I just, I went, and I realized I was moving at a phenomenal rate of speed. And I'm in this vehicle looking thing. It looked like. A ski lift, not that you, it's not a ski lift, a, a cable car, you understand? Not something that you can hang your feet off of, an enclosure. And I'm traveling, and I turned around, and when I looked up, it was that same blonde-headed angel that had told me, and I went, hey. <laughs> and he smiled at me. He said, you have an appointment with the Lord God Jehovah. And I thought, man, in my, wait, oh. I mean, whoo, I mean, we are rolling. It looked like a, ch- it fe- I-, I called it a chariot without any horses. A- an enclosure looking type thing. I mean, going at a phenomenal rate of speed. And all, all of a sudden I felt the thing slow down. And it come to a stop. And ladies and gentlemen, when that door opened, the shock of my life. You see, heaven is wonderful. It's a big place. He hasn't destroyed paradise. It's all around, all completely around that holy city. It looks like a, it's a planet. I walked out and saw mountains and streams and trees and flowers and the fragrances. I looked and I didn't, I just was amazed. And I come out and I went, glory to God. And the the angel went, Glory to God. And we both start praising. Glory to God. You just say, hallelujah. That starts a reaction, boy. <laughs> hallelujah. Just praising God. And I'm looking around. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? I'm walking. I mean, I'm physically walking like I am on this platform. Beautiful, gorgeous trees and streams and water and mountains. Totally comfortable. Yet I saw snow, yet not cold. I, nothing brown, nothing lush, beautiful, gorgeous valleys and mountains and streams. And I looked at him and I said, what am I doing here? He said, you have an appointment with the great God Jehovah. He said, we must go to the city. Now paradise is very big. It's huge. So we were walking. We started to walk and I saw trees lined up on the side of River of Life, ladies. I knew it was that, with thousands of people under them. I mean, it just goes forever. It just seemed like forever. And these, how do I say this? These contraptions were bringing people, and these angels were coming out and assigning people. And I noticed that I was in my clothes. I was in the clothes that I had on. But these people that were coming out of these machines, looking, I call it a machine-looking thing, some had robes of righteousness, beautiful, glorious. And they got out and ran, just took off running straight to that city, man, in that line. There's some that got out, they didn't have a robe on. They had like, like a gown on. And they would head for that throne. Everybody wants to get to the throne. Everywhere you look, you can see that throne. I mean, it just, it's just everywhere. You can see it. It's high. And you, I saw them, and all of a sudden, they'd get out of the line, the people with the gowns, and they, they'd walk over. And they'd go and eat those trees. It, it was eating, looked like fruit. And, and they would take the leaves and do this. And I asked that angel, I said, what is that? I said, those people can't go to the throne of God? He said, yes, the great God Jehovah is merciful. I said, but 
In my theological mind, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, that's true that the, the minute you walk over to that other side. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, some people don't live for God the way they should. But you see, God's merciful. He still helps them and touches them. But they look different. They got to be taught. If you don't learn it here, you are going to learn it there. Now, I'm telling you. And these gowns are beautiful. And when I got back to the earth, I began to research it and I found out that God gives us a robe of righteousness and a gown of salvation. There's a difference. And some people don't live close to God, but yet they know Jesus in their life. They could do so much better. They're going to go to the throne, but it takes time for them. Everybody's trying to get to that throne. And as I was walking, I looked and I saw a man. He went, hey, Jesse. And I knew him immediately. He was thick barrel chested man. I said, you, you Abraham. He said, yes. He said, this is still my bosom. He said, I meet everybody here. So I hadn't got to the gate of the city yet. He said, how you doing? I said, <laughs> I said, I'm doing fine. Glory to God. When I said that, he went, glory to God. The angel went, glory to God. He just starts a chain reaction. People start hollering and praising God. And I noticed his size. He looked of great age, yet he was young looking. But yet you could tell he was a patriarch. He looked of great age, yet young looking. And I just looked at it. And the first thing I thought of, I'm the seed of Abraham. This is my great 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 grandpa. Wouldn't be for him. I wouldn't be here. You know, it's through Jesus, but I'm the seed of Abraham. And I'm just looking, and the angel said, Come on, you have an appointment. So Abraham's walking with me. He said, Are you thirsty? I said, Yeah. Yeah. And he had a gold goblet in his hand, ladies and gentlemen. And he reached down into that river. It, it, it looked like a stream, a very big stream. Not like a Mississippi River, but a stream, but pure and clear. He, thought, he said, drink some water. And I looked at that gold goblet. I went, man, look. I mean, this ain't a plastic cup from Sam's. This is, a, <laughs> this is a golden goblet. It was heavy. And I was getting weak. My knees would buckle. And I don't know what this is till today, but this angel said, eat this fruit so you can withstand the glory of God. It was a copper colored looking fruit. I had a color here. I'd show you what it was. I don't know what kind. I would eat it and I would get strength. But I wanted to talk to Abraham. I just wanted to look at it. And then I noticed all the people around me. And in my theological mind, I thought everybody went to heaven was grown up. But there's children there. There's animals there. I saw horses. I saw dogs. I mean, few flowers. We went across this path of, and I didn't want to step on these flowers. I went, I oh. And the angel said, walk on. I said, okay. And when I stepped, the flowers went through my legs. Never smashed them. They just kept moving. And when you walk by, they turn around. They look, they can see you. Then. I mean, and the fragrance and the beauty is beyond human reasoning. I'm in this line. He said, we must take you to the city. You have an appointment. But I wanted to talk to Abraham more, you know, because my favorite scripture in the Bible, favorite scriptures, he called it those things that be not as though they were. I wanted to talk to him about Romans 4, 17. <laughs> I want to consider not staggering out and fully persuaded. I, I realized I just wanted to talk to him. You want to stay a million years in one place just to look. I hadn't got to the city yet, and I hadn't got to the throne. I'm still going toward that. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if you've had a lost loved one that's died and went home to be with Jesus, it happened two years ago, they hadn't even got to the gate yet. Because a thousand years is in one day with the Lord. You equate two years, that's about a second and a half on a thousand. They still like, they just come out that machine going, wow, look at this place. But I got in the line with those people. And people would come up to me. And I noticed children singing. Children had little harps. Look about this big. Then I heard this. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. And the angel of the Lord said, come on quickly. We must go. He's coming. And I understand this scripture. Suffer, not the, suffer the children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of God. And I saw a glorious light coming. 
And I looked at Abraham. He said, that's him. It's Jesus. And the angel said, come on, come on. He started moving me toward this. And I can't tell you all the whole story. It's all on taste. But anyway, as I walked toward that, I got by that Jasper wall. And that, that interested me because I studied Revelation. I wanted to see that foundation. I said, wait, stop, stop. I want, I want to see those, the names of the apostles. Hang on a second. And I saw Peter. It, it was, I mean, I looked at the first one and I saw Peter. And it, 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 was, it was just Peter. And the first thing I thought next would be John, but it wasn't. It said Peter, Paul, James, John on them stones, on that foundation. And the angel said, come on, come on. The Lord walked out and these children ran up to him and began to sing praises to him. And he just hugged them. But to me, he looked like a shaft of light. He was so glo His clothes looked like solid diamonds sparkling. Just, just flowing. Just beautiful. And he, these kids sang. And he just rejoiced with them. The amphitheater's all over this place. This is all in the paradise end of it. And you're going to meet Abraham. That's the first guy you're going to see. All of you that are born again. He's a nice person. I went in, and as I walked, he turned toward me. Jesus is between 5'11 and about 6 foot 1. I said, more close. He's taller than I thought he was. And his hair, I thought, was like mine, white. But he turned his head just a little. And I caught a glance, and his hair was light brown. But yet, when he looks at you, the glory of God is emanating from him. I fell at his feet. Just fell down, man. The angel of the Lord fell down. You bite the dust. And I saw his feet. And in all my life, I thought Jesus had uh, scars. But those holes in his feet were this big. I could see the light shining through it. I understand that his feet look like burnished brass, bronze, because the glory of God emanated. Then I realized how big those nails were. You people don't realize how much he suffered. Man cannot write it down. There's no adjectives to understand what Christ went through to describe it. I fell at his feet. I'll never forget this. And I put my hand. He said, stand to your feet. And the first thing I thought of doing was confess. I said, look. That's... He said, you're forgiven. I said, hey, you're... And he put his hand on this shoulder. And he looked at me. He said, go tell my people I'm coming. And I thought he was going to give me a great... I said, and he, he would answer me when I thought. I said, but they know that. He said, no, they don't know that. Don't tell them I'm coming. I brought you here to tell you. Go tell them I'm coming. And he had his hand on my... Do you hear me? I'm coming. Go tell them. I guess that's why I haven't rested in my life. Just, it's such an urgency in people. Just know something is up. He's soon to come, ladies and gentlemen. The flowers. You want to see Jesus. You want to see Abraham. You want to look at flowers. You want to see gold streets. You want to see the city with a glorious, magnificent skyline that, that's in there. You, you're doing this, trying to, but earthly eyes, that's why we need, we need this new body bad. So we can consume what God, because this natural mind can't, it just boggles at the thing. It's just amazing. He put his hand on my shoulder. I'll never forget that. He said, what does it look like? Love. He looks right through you. Glory emanating from him. You just, you want to hug him. You, you reach out. It's an automatic reaction. And he doesn't do this. He just grabs you. He can look at millions of people. And yet, you're the only one he sees. He said, there's many things you shall see here and learn. But I brought you here to tell you that go tell my people I'm coming. And he turned around. He took me by the hand. 
He said, I want, to, I want you to meet another king. And I saw a man walking toward me. And he had reddish hair. And he had a red beard. And it was a beard about this wide coming like this. And I knew him immediately. I just knew it. And the Lord said, I must go back to the throne. My father calls me. And he turned around, walked off. And that angel, and I looked at that man. And I said, your name is David, isn't it? He said, yes. I said, oh, king. He said, stand, don't, don't bow. He said, you just looked at the king of kings. He said, I've been assigned to take you around. I said, listen, is there anything I can do for you? That's what I said. I said, is there, listen, I told him, listen. And he said, you don't understand. We are servants here. We're here to serve you. What do you want, Jesse? What do you need? And I began to look at the angel, look like this. And that angel said, what are you looking for? I said, you don't have no shadow. You see that shadow? See the darkness in here? There's none of that in heaven. He looked at me and said, no, there's no shadows here. God is light in whom there's no darkness, no shadow of turning. There is no darkness whatsoever. None. It's light. I mean, that amazed me. I said that several times to the angel. He said, what are you looking for? I said, I just can't. He said, there's no darkness here. And David said, I'm going to take you down some streets. He took me down the street of the prophets and I met Jonah. I was interested in that. He said, and I've been instructed by the Lord to take you to your house. My place. I said, okay. But you see, I wanted to stay at the Jasper Wall. I wanted to talk more to Abraham. I wanted to talk more to Jesus. I was interested in that angel. I wanted to look at them gold streets. I wanted to smell all those flowers. I wanted to talk more to Jesus. But there's a schedule to keep. I'm, I'm, my God. And as I'm walking through there, I saw Paul the Apostle sitting down with several men around him. I knew it was Paul. He said, Jesse. He said, he knows my name. Glory to God. He said, what are they saying about my gospel? He still calls it his gospel. And as I said this morning, I told him, I said, listen, I preach everything you say. <laughs> everything. If you come back, you can get me for a copyright infringement. I, I tell you what, man, the Pauline epistle is wonderful. And he smiled at me. And they were discussing the word of God, Pastor Osteen. Discussing the word of God. As David walked with me, I said, you've always been an interesting character to me. I said, I was prophesied on as a child that I would work, have a, a life similar to you. Now, I didn't say this in the tapes, but the Lord will let me reveal this to you. He said, I'll pray for you. He said, there were some things if I'd have listened to the Lord, I would have never went through. He said, so now you have my record. So follow the record God told me, and you won't walk through some of the places that I walked through. I'll never forget that. I said, thank you. He took me to my house. Ladies and gentlemen, ABC prime time would get mad as a hornet if they saw my house. <laughs> They'd have a conniption fit. You would not believe this place. I walked into this home. There's a water fountain in the front yard. I love manicured grass. And a weed in my yard. I don't like any of that. I like the sidewalks edged. I got the street edged. Edged. I like it pretty. Golf course looking pretty. Cut. Perfect. Every year I buy Kathy shears and things to help <laughs> to make sure. I just like a manicured place. When I, I looked at the yards, the ground, I said, look at this place. To me, the foyer of a home sets the mood of a house. When I opened that door, I went, <gasps> I love tall ceilings, 10 to 12 foot ceilings. I love crown moldings and, you know, those big molders, antebellum looking stuff. I was born in the wrong century. I look and it was exact. I went, look at this place. This is it. And when I looked at the furniture, I said, Hey, I got furniture like that on the earth. And David looked at me and said, I said, this is ball and cloth furniture. This is cabriolet. This is Queen Anne. Furniture. I love this. I like cherry wood and mahoganies and things like that. 
And the, he said, yes, the Lord knew you'd like it, so we put it in your home. I said, what? He said, we told you he'd give you the desires of your heart. Down to the last detail. You ought to see my place. Well, you will. You will. I mean, it's beautiful. I had marble. I looked at more physical things, I guess, in my home than I did anywhere else. I had a table in that foyer. God, it had golden eagles on it. I said, look at this thing. <laughs> Big place. He said, you like it? I said, I like it. I said, this is beautiful. Everything decorated. Everything. And I said, Lord. I said, David, it looks a lot like earth. There's a lot of things here that look like earth. And I asked the Lord later about this. And David said the same thing. He said, well, the earth is the Lord's taste. Remember, he created the earth. So what you see there, you'll see a lot of that here. There are flowers there I've never seen before in my life and fragrances I've never smelled. I've never seen reds like I've seen or greens or purples or blues, yellows. My God, I mean, when I say color, you've never seen color like this. Gold that is gold but yet transparent. Gold that looks like crystal, yet it's gold. Beautiful. beautiful. Now, my house was not on the street of the prophets. It was turned, turned to the right. The prophets' homes were gorgeous and beautiful. He said, you have an appointment. I said, I'm going to the throne. And you know, when I got there, immediately I wanted to go. This place is unreal. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to miss heaven. I was more interested in the people than I would say the physical things till I got to my house. I couldn't believe, I, I, what words can I say? I said, my God. Then I realized he's a too much God. What that means by that, your cup runneth over. So he just keeps pouring. See, if your kid keeps pouring in the cup and he spills it all over, you call it waste. God keeps pouring. He calls it prosperity. So your cup runneth over. He feeds 5,000 people that are so full they can't walk, but there's 12 baskets over. So he's more than enough. See, everybody else considers it waste. He doesn't consider it waste. He calls it prosperity. He just keeps pouring. You say, it's running off. It, 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 the cup's full. It, it, it's rolling off the floor. It, 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 it's going off the table. It's going out in the front yard, and God's still pouring. Till you get to a point, you go, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed back in bread. <laughs> you see, he's a God, an abundant God. And I would get weak, and I ate this fruit. It was this copper-colored-looking type of fruit. It was sweet taste. It was very juicy. I bit into it. It went down. I was embarrassed. I went. <laughs> and they said, it's all right, but it would give me strength. And plus, I hadn't eaten. I'd left my food on the table. So the Lord was helping me out. The leaves of the healing of the, the trees, the tree of life, the leaves of the healing of the nation, I can understand that. They would smell those leaves. And then they'd get back in those lines. And you'd see there's some people don't live the way they should live for God. There's degrees there, yet there's no jealousy there. Kathy always told me, you know, Jesse, when we go to heaven, I know with God, we're not married, but I wouldn't mind living with you. You know, I mean, you know, ladies and gentlemen, make this announcement. There are families there, but it's not like you think here. I mean, your wife is still your wife. Your children are still your children. So I didn't understand that. See, my mother passed away. I didn't see my mom. I knew she was there. Maybe it would have hurt me too much to see her or I wouldn't want to come back. But see, my daddy married another lady. And I knew, I said, something wrong, man. Because I know my mama. And I believe daddy, daddy's still living. And I believe Jesus Christ is coming in his lifetime, which is my lifetime. The Bible said the dead in Christ is going to rise first. So mama's coming out the grave. And her spirit and body are going to connect together. She's going to be on that cloud first. Then my daddy's coming. Then Esther's coming. <laughs> and I know my mama, she's going to say, who's that woman, Paul? <laughs> and I know my daddy, he's going to say, I ain't never saw her before in my life. <laughs> I, don't know. I know my daddy, boy. But you don't have to worry about that. There's no jealousy or malice or anything of that nature. I saw a family... They asked me if I would go on. As I was walking toward the throne, 
I met this family that died in an airplane accident. Children, family. They were going on a picnic. They said, would you like to come with us on a picnic? And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that angel and David said, you have an appointment at the throne. I said, I'll see you all later then. Walking in the different things. I'm going through this as quick as I can. When I got to the throne of God, I couldn't stand up. I saw 24 thrones, but no one was sitting in them. And I asked that angel, I asked them 24 elders. He said, yes. I said, well, where are they? He said, Jesse, we are servants here. He said, they're in the city. They're ministering. They're ministering constantly. Servants. You are a servant. We serve you. Everybody serves. It's what you can do for you. You always say, can I help? Somebody's always trying to do something for you. The children, the babies singing. If you've had a miscarriage, if you've had an abortion, don't worry about it. You didn't lose your baby. The Lord's got that baby. You never have to worry about it. Never. Never. He holds those. I saw those little souls at the throne of God. They look about this big. Look like they got a little nightgown on them. And they would fly. They could fly. And they would fly into that presence of Jehovah. And I'd hear them saying, can we be a spirit? Can we be a spirit? Would you send us to the earth so we can be a spirit? We want to be a redeemed person. Can we be a spirit? So now I know how God sends these babies. They look like little, 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 little bitty things about this big. They just go out of the breath of God. The gifts. And that's how your grandbaby, that's how that baby, that's how that baby was before she became a spirit. When I got to the throne of God, I hit the ground. I couldn't stand up. The light was so bright. The angel of the Lord gave me some fruit. He said, eat this so you can withstand the glory of God. The closer you get to the throne, the weaker you become because of the glory of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm about ready to tell you, it's going to shock you. I could not. I saw Jehovah, the Father's feet. But I also, you know, I said it on the table, I only saw his feet. But he was sitting down. And I saw his hand, I mean, this lower part, he was sitting like this in his hand. He is so powerful. I heard this, whoa, whoa, massive amount of energy. That's the only way I can explain that. Power, if he would just barely move, a universe would annihilate. Jehovah, Elohim, Yahweh, just, and in this, and I'm looking like this, and I could only like see his feet, and I saw his finger. His hand, like, you know, the lower part of his body, what I meant, like, the, he did, and these angels flying, flying the great God, Jehovah, and smoke just coming up and just, just, and this massive sound, <laughs> power like I've never experienced in my life. And these big angels, and these had wings flying in that throne saying, the great God, Jehovah, and just, and I saw the hand, like he said, even though it was, I said it in the tape like it was his feet, but it was in his lower part. His finger did this. I want everybody to see this. His finger just did. And when he moved, an angel of God was thrown up against a wall. The angel went, bam, flying. I mean, like if Jehovah just moves without it being calculated, gone. Power. And in this massive light, I'm laying on my face, if I can, like this, literally like this trying and I'm getting weaker looking like this and out of that massive light there's one yet there's two I see like another individual they're one yet they're two I could say this in tongues I don't know how to explain this in English and out of this massive energy of light and love and power comes Jesus he's the, he's in the father the father's in him he's like at the right hand of God you understand I understand that statement. He comes out of that power. And when he came, he comes out in human form, something we can touch. And there's mil seem like millions of people at the throne of God just bit the dust. And all of a sudden, he comes out of that light. And there he is, like I saw him in paradise. And all my life as a minister, I thought he was a teacher. You know, a very mild-mannered, calm person. He came out on that platform, on that throne. You could hear just the father going, just power. And the people, and he came out. And he's not a teacher. 
even though I know he can teach, but he's a preacher. And he began to shout. Jesus shout. He said, I'm going to get your brothers. I'm going to get your sisters. I'm going to get your family. And I'm bringing them back to this place to live with me forever and ever. He's a preacher. He shouts. He hollers. Man. I'm, you know what I thought of? I thought, man, Shambach ain't got nothing on Jesus. He's a shout. He hollered. He was excited. People screaming and hollering. I'm laying on the floor trying to glimpse this stuff. It was the most powerful experience I ever went through. People shouting and I mean loud. And he's preaching. I mean, he, and he, he hollers. I was amazed. Because I thought he, you know, he walk around like this. No. Oh, I mean, he's excited. Now, you can't see Jehovah's face and live. At least I couldn't. But I'll explain this statement. I would see Jesus and he would stop. And I could look at him. See, because the heart of God is the Father. The face of God is the Son, Jesus. The voice of God is the Holy Ghost. But the hand of God is the church. And I saw him, and I seen him turn around several times like this, and he'd look at and that massive black. And that's when I noticed I couldn't, because you see, I, I'm looking down it, but I could see Jesus' face. I could bear that power. But when I'd go to try to look at the fire, he would walk out and walk in. He'd go into the fire. He'd go into the fire. He'd just walk in it, into that massive amount of energy. But he would look, and I've never seen love. Like I, I saw that. You could sense the love of God just, just pulling from Christ. And you could see Christ just giving love back and forth. It was just such a magnetism. I asked the stupidest question anyone would ever ask in heaven. I'm still embarrassed to say it. I'm laying on the floor. I asked that angel. I, I was very interested in the Trinity. You, you, they, they're three, yet they're one. And I said, where's the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and I never, the angel said, he's on the earth. I said, oh yeah, yeah, I know that. I, know that. <laughs> I felt so stupid. <laughs> he's on the earth. Yeah, he's on the earth. He said, he's on the earth. Oh, yes, yes, I knew that. After I was back into my own body, I, I thought, I felt like Clouseau. Yes, I know that. You know, I felt so stupid to ask such a dumb question at the throne of God. And all of a sudden, that angel said, we must go. We walked out of that throne. It is so massive. The angel singing and shouting. Those little souls going into there and God just breathing them. And they like little gifts to people that are wanting babies. If you had a baby that died passed away, accident, something happened. And if you would live to be a ripe old age, that baby would grow up. That's the first person you're going to see other than Abraham when you get there. That baby waiting to see you. But there'll be a grown person if it takes, a, if it takes you a long time before you go home to be with God. But if you've had a baby and they passed away and a couple, two or three years later you would pass away, you will raise that child. Those children are taught the oracles of God. I saw Oriental children, but I didn't see many, many Oriental adults. And I realized that there comes a time where you either accept Christ or reject Him. But see, God don't lose them babies. All these millions of babies that have been destroyed, the Lord's got them. He's got them. They're growing. They're being taught the oracles of God. It was a wonderful thing. As I walked out, they were shouting and praising. I heard that familiar voice, Jesse. And this is the part that gets to me. This is not, I don't know if this is on the tape back there or not. Because some things God lets me reveal. I turned around. He said, you heard what I said. Now, just looking at him. He said, go tell my people I'm coming. I said, Lord, I, I'll do everything I know to do. 
And that angel was standing there and David was standing there. I said, I love you with all of my being. I, I made some mistakes in my life. He said, I don't, I don't know you did. I washed them away. I didn't know you did. You're free. I said, listen. Thank you. And I saw a tear swell up in his eye. And he said this statement to me as we were walking. He said, now this is a strange to you maybe, but not to me, because I was there. He said, the worst day of my life is yet to come. And he was talking with, all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus Christ, God, is sharing with his creation. He said, you know that scripture, I said that I will wipe away all tears in heaven. I said, you know, Lord, I, I never truly understood that. You know, I mean, in some ways I did, in some ways I didn't. He says, that's tears in my eyes, Jesse. He said, on that great judgment day, I will have to tell the creation that I love to depart from me. Now, he's got tears in his eyes when he's saying this now. He's swelling up in tears in his eyes. Man, it's touching my heart. I want to reach out to him and comfort him. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't say this at the Believer's Man. I put my hand on the Lord and I, I, I just kind of, I didn't know what, 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 you know, if somebody you love, you, you do that. You know, I mean, it's kind of, I don't know. He said, I dread that day. I dread it. I dread it. I said, you know, Lord, I thought everybody was going to be mean and more vicious. No, God will be tears in his eyes crying as he sends this creation whom he died for and loved. He said, Jesse, it's final. I can't change it. He said, tears flowed from my eyes the day my creation, Adam, fell. But I knew I would send myself that I had a chance to touch people. He said, but this day is coming. It's final. I can't change it once it's said. He said, I have to wipe the tears from my eye. Then I realized that God needs our love. I didn't realize how much he needed me. See, I've always thought of me needing him. You know, how much he needed me. I said, I'll do anything for you. I said, that may be a rash statement. I said, Peter said that. I said, but far as I know, I'll do anything for you. And he smiled at me. He said, I chose you. I said, he said, no one else wanted you. But I need you, boy. I need you, Jesse. I said, okay. I'll tell every soul I meet that you're coming. He said, I brought you here for this. Then he looked at David and that angel. He said, take Jesse by the way of the mountains when you take him home. He likes mountains. And he looked at me and smiled. And I'm noticing his features now. He said, I'll see you soon. He said, one day we'll never part. It'll be forever. And sooner than you think. I got back in that machine with David and uh, with that angel. And as we were going out, I was going up again. I saw people waving at me. And I saw apartments and condominiums. And I looked and I thought, I knew I was coming out of the city into that paradise section again. I said, what are those? He said, Jesse, every desire is given. He said, every one of those people that live there have a home in the city, but some of them like a place in the country. The Lord knew it. He gave it to them. He said, there's no desire that's not met. There's no want that's not given. I didn't hear a sign of greed in this. The Lord just blessing. And there were people waving at me. And ladies and gentlemen, it seemed like 30 minutes 
as I went and I heard that, I call it a machine, that chariot looking, it began to accelerate. And I come to myself and I'm in the same position that I was at one o'clock. And it's quarter after six. I'd been there five hours and 15 minutes. And the first thing I did was, God, man, they're coming to quarter seven to pick me up to go preach. So I ran, just ran into the shower. But I was befuddled. I, I said, I ain't saying nothing about this. <laughs> People think I'm crazy. So the guy that had been picking me up every night was a talker. Well, when I, he got quarter to seven, I cleaned up, shaved as quick as I could. I got in the car. He ain't said a word to me. He just looked at me. I thought, did I say something to offend him? So I didn't say nothing. Driving to the church, he just looked at me. When we got there, the service was already started. They were singing. So I walked from the back of the church up the front. As I was walking, people began to point their fingers at me. One of my tape men were there, Brother Fritz Brown. They were pointing their fingers at me. Look at Brother Justin. Then they began to look like this. I was lit up like a, I mean, like a light. I mean, I'm shining. I can't see it. I mean, I look in the mirror. I just see this Cajun face. I don't see nothing. Lit up, people going. So they start looking for, like, for television lights to see what was on my face. And when I walked to the platform, the pastor was just, he went, he just backed up. I, I was going to go sit down at the little half pew they got right there. And he just met, motioned me to come. And I just came and I said, I've been in the presence of God. And they thought I was praying. Oh, I ain't talking about praying. I'm talking physical press. And people begin to fall out in the spirit of God. I didn't pre I didn't say nothing to them that night. Not a word. I went back. My mind was tripping, boy. I said, I've been to heaven. So five days later, I said, Kathy, sit down. I want you to listen to this. And Jules and Deborah, our, uh, Kathy's uh, sister, came over. And I was about ready to tell all of them because they're on my board of directors. And Deborah interrupts me and says, you know, I had a dream the other night that I was in heaven sitting with my four children. And I realized I must have missed God because I only have three children. I have Jules Jr., I have Ryan, and I have Julie. And I looked at Deborah. I said, no, you have four. She said, no, I have three. I said, no, you have four. I said, you lost a baby, remember? She said, yeah. I said, Deborah, Jules, Kathy, grab your seat. Listen to this. And when I mentioned about those babies, Deborah busted out crying. I said, what you dream was true. You got four kids. That other one's waiting for you. Deborah just was so blessed and touched. I put it on tape because I didn't want it to become spectacular. And I really condensed this. There's a lot more to it. But I ask you to meet my Jesus. Since this experience, I understand fellowship. And I'll say this, and I'm going to ask you to make a decision tonight. I walked in my study to pray as I normally do. I have a habit of saying, hello, Jesus. And he says, hi, Jesse. It's a first name basis. I walked into that study, and something was wrong, Pastor Osteen. I sensed it. And it wasn't with me. Everything was going great. Everything was fine. So I began to pray like I normally prayed, and the Lord began to minister to me, and I ministered to Him. Finally, I said, something's wrong. Lord, something's wrong. And it's not with me. Then I realized. And I said, Lord, somebody hurt you today? Somebody hurt you today? You're not acting like you normally act. Somebody hurt you today? The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. He said, you know me, don't you? He said, my children have disobeyed me. See, we use the terminology, we grieve the Holy Spirit so loosely. You hurt him. His capacity to hurt is greater than yours. His capacity to love is greater than yours. I said, somebody hurt you today, Lord. 
I said, listen, I'm going to cancel all my appointments today. I'm shutting it down. And I'm going to praise you, and I'm going to love you, and I'm going to rejoice and honor you and call your name Hosanna. I'm going to stay here. For lack of a better word, God, to say, till you feel better. And I stood in that study, and I praised God, and I shouted, and I cried, and I loved the Lord. And I said, come here, come here. Let me hug you. Come here. And I just loved you and honored him. And it was about an hour and a half, and I heard him go, thank you. You can go back to your appointments. You bless me. I ask all you people today. Have you heard him today? Did he want to talk to you today and you told him you didn't have time? Have you heard him today? You know, he's a loving God and he's, he'll forgive you. But you ever had your feelings hurt? Can you imagine how Jesus feels when his people don't come to church? I'm going to get serious with this now. I don't miss church. It's a service for me. It's an appointment. I want to hurt it. Have you heard him today? I ask you that. Did he ask you to give him a little time and you tell him, I don't have time right now? Why don't you love him today? Because he loves you. And if he could, he'd die again for you. He can't because the Bible said you can't crucify him twice. I made up my mind, Pastor Osteen, I don't want to hurt him no more. He's so easily hurt. So, I just obey his word. And I shun publicity. Because I know what he needs is love. And I'm going to give him every bit of it I got. And when he asks me to do something, I'm going to do it. And he doesn't ask me for hard things. So I ask you to bow your heads today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and I know it's late, it's 928. If you'd like to meet my friend Jesus... He would love to meet you. I really condensed this heavenly vision. It takes three hours or better. You'll have to get the tapes to understand it. I ask you to meet my friend. Will you let Christ come into your life? If you've never been saved and you'd like to get saved. Let me take it a step further. Maybe you're not where you should be with God. I'm not saying you're backslidden to hell, no. But you're not living the way you should live for God, and you need to come back to Him. Or maybe you hurt Him today. How about love Him today? I'm going to ask you, if you're not saved, or if you're not where you should be with God, you need to... Draw closer to him. Come back to him. Give your life back to him. Or you realized you may have hurt him today and you need to come love him. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and walk to the front of this great building. I want everybody to pray. I want you to be honest with yourself and honest with God. If you don't know Jesus or you're not where you should be, well, you need to come and say, Lord, I, I want to love you. Get out of your seat now and come up here. Quickly, people coming from all over the building. Tears in their eyes. People are getting saved. People are coming back to God. Oh, you, yes, Lord, thank you. He so said, tell those ladies, I, I saved your baby. I got them. You've had pain on the earth, but you're going to have great joy in heaven. Get out of your seat and come. We're going to have a lot of them, brother. You may have to pack them in here. That's fine. Don't hurt him anymore. 
if you'd like to sing something softly, that'd be fine. Say, Brother Jesse, I don't know if I can believe these things. I understand that. But look at the people that are coming. Holy Ghost moving on them. These are true, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus loves you and died for you. Quickly come. Just pack them in here, ushers, the best we can. Come on. Come on, let Jesus help you today. There are people getting saved all over this building. There are people giving their lives back to God. There are people saying, I'm sorry, God, I didn't mean to hurt you. Just come on, pack in here. The Holy Spirit is here, brother. This is an oasis of love. If you're way up in the balconies, it'll take you a couple of minutes to walk down. Come on. The Lord is waiting on you. Oh, you're making him happy right now. He's reaching out to you right now. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Lord. Come on, brother, we're waiting for you. Come on, little lady, we're waiting for you. Come on, sweetheart, we're waiting for you. Look at the people coming. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, we're waiting for you. We're waiting for you, man. Bring your baby. Come on. Come on, sir. Hey, people still coming. Sing that again, brother. Go ahead. God is moving upon people. Just come on. Hallelujah, Lord. Come on, sweetheart. There are people still coming. I want you to listen to me. At the throne of God, it's a lot like this. People, yet they lay prostrate before the anointing of God. They just fall, then they get up, and the Lord ministers to them. I want you to pray a prayer with me. Then I'm going to ask Pastor Osteen to say something to you. The Lord sent us here. He backed up schedules. He sent us here. I want to lead you in a prayer that I know will work for you, whether it's a first time salvation, whether it's a selling out for Jesus, coming back to the Lord, whether it's I'm a sorry Lord for hurting your feelings. I don't know how, what other word to use, lack of, but he loves so much and yet he can hurt so much. So next time you hear somebody said the Holy Spirit was grieved, explain it to him. You don't know what you said. Oh, when you hurt him. And I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. I'm going to ask you to say it with your heart and confess it with your mouth. When we finish this prayer, you'll be in the kingdom of God, whether it's a first time salvation, whether it's a selling out for the Lord, coming back to him in a greater way, 
the washing of the water of the word flowing through your life. You ready to pray? I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after. I'm going to ask everyone in the church to pray with us. Repeat it after. Let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I confess my sin. Before you this day, I denounce Satan and all his works. I confess Jesus as the Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. For bringing me back to where I once was. From this day forward, Lord Jesus, I'll be sensitive to how you feel. I won't hurt you. I will obey you. Lord Jesus, I ask you to present me to Jehovah in your name. Lord Jesus, I believe with my heart, I confess with my mouth that you rose from the dead, that I am saved. I receive you today wholeheartedly, 100%. Make me a light in a dark place. And from this day forward, I will leave this place and share you with everyone I meet and everyone I know. It's commitment, Jesus. I will get this world for you. I pray this prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen and amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap.